We are back and we are joined now by Juliet Hooker, Royce Family Professor of Teaching Excellence in Political Science at Brown University, Professor of Political Science at Brown University, author of her latest book, Black Grief, White Grievance, The Politics of Loss. Juliet, thanks so much for coming on the show today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course. So grief and grievance, black grief, white grievance. I mean, it's right there in the title, obviously. And at, uh, the the way the, the words sound, right? Grief and grievance sound like they are related, and they are uh, in, in the English language. But as within the context of political loss within our country, which is what you look at, they mean very, very different things. So let's start there with those kinds of you know different constructs of grief and grievance. Absolutely. So one of the arguments in the book um, is that black grief and white grievance are two of the driving forces behind racial politics in the United States right now. And so what I'm arguing is that people are mobilizing in the United States in response to real or imagined in some cases losses. And that when we think about black grievance, you know, we can think about a, a tradition uh, where black people in the United States have mobilized in response to unimaginable tragedies and become activists to try to get um, justice for their dead in the case of, of you know, lynchings in the case of police killings. And on the other hand, we have white grievance, which is this phenomenon where, you know, because they have been the dominant group at the center of U.S. politics, you know, the dominant group politically, socially, economically, there are some whites who feel like any gain by another group is a form of displacement, right? They're, they react to the sense that the U.S. is becoming a more equal or a more diverse society by seeing themselves as victims and feeling like they are the rightful center of U.S. politics and that they should not ever have to lose and that if they do lose, it's illegitimate or it was because there was cheating or malfeasance or something of that sort. I mean, what could you possibly be referencing there? <laughs> right. It, it, within mm -hmm. the, you know, in the, in before the Biden election or Biden came into office, right, there were two prime juxtaposing examples of that the Black Lives Matter movement in the year 2020, and mm -hmm. then January 6, six days right. after 2020 concluded. Absolutely, and those are two examples that I write about in the book, right? So January 6th, you see this mobilization um, of people who are determined to believe that there was, you know, a fraudulent election and refuse to accept that they, they have lost. And I think part of that narrative that we saw came out of this view that it was, you know, people who weren't, as Sarah Palin would have called them, real Americans who drove the results, right? So, you you know, so it was um, multiracial cities, it was college students who shouldn't have been able to vote, the sense that it was the wrong people or it was immigrants, right? And that those people shouldn't have as much of a say in the direction of the country as others. Right. And, and it, it gives, I think, you know, uh, as we analyze what democracy really means, and if as we're in this kind of perilous moment for democracy, um, it's it it really sh shows, I think, how uh, democracy has grown to a, a, a we're at a place in its history, right, where it means wildly different things for for different people. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's so in the news, so I apologize for bringing it to this, but it's like Israel's the only democracy in the Middle East. And what does democracy mean? I mean, it, it, there are millions mm -hmm. of Palestinians who can't vote. I mean, what does democracy mean in this country, right? There are so many people who don't have the ability to have their voice heard through the franchise. And um, you kind of come to see that white grievance surrounding that uh, it, democracy is more... You know, we, we want representation for the real folks. And um, I, I think that that is why there's so much uh, talking past one another when even talking about the concept of democracy. Absolutely. And I think one of the, the things here is that we often think about democracy in terms of empowerment, right? You go out, you organize, you get people like you to have um, say and your policy gets adopted. But democracy is also about losing, right? It's about losing well. 
if you have, if there has been no, you know, if the rules have been fair and everybody has followed and you lose a policy argument, you're supposed to accept it and come back. And I think what we're seeing is a real refusal, a sense that if for some people in the United States right now, that if their political project um, doesn't win, if they can't convert people to their ideas, then they're willing to dispense with democracy. I mean, I think we're seeing this on abortion, right, where you saw some folks who after the referendums that have, um, you know, preserved abortion rights, you have, you know, anti-abortion folks saying, well, maybe that's too much direct democracy, right? Right. We shouldn't allow that to happen. So I think there's definitely um, a sense that, um, you know, democracy is is under threat. One of the arguments in the book is that white grievance is actually the biggest threat to U.S. democracy right now. And I think one of the things that we need to to look at is the fact that U.S. democracy was not in good shape, right? A lot of people respond to this moment by saying, oh, if we can just get back to the rule of law or get past, you know, Trump or whoever, then we will be fine. But actually, democracy wasn't working for a lot of people. And there are a lot of problems with U.S. democracy that we need to be thinking about. Certainly. Um, And I, it strikes me, you know, your book talking about the different and really unfair expectations for how black versus white voters respond to political loss. Um, Explain that concept to our audience, if you don't mind, and how, honestly, black voters, specifically black women within the context of the Democratic Party, are expected to be the heroes of democracy. Um, And the, the just like completely unfair burden placed on voters that the white working class people at the diner who CNN decided to profile 4,000 times in the wake of Trump's 2016 victory don't necessarily, um, you know, they, they, they don't they don't bear the brunt. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that that we need to be really clear about is that black voters in particular, I mean, there's, you know, political science and research that support this, that, you know, the preferences of, of white voters tend to win more than those of any other voters, irrespective of any other factor. So race is the biggest predictor of whether your policy positions will prevail. But beyond that, I think we tend to think about these moments of extraordinary sacrifices by black citizens as things that they should simply be doing, right? Things that we have come to expect or things that we honor, quote unquote, but that don't really drive policy. So one example of this is is when we see, you know, these stories that come out every election year about, you know, the the people who had to stand for in line for 8 hours and how amazing it was that they stood for 8 hours to exercise their right to vote. But it's like that's not a sign. It's a sign that these people were amazing and civic minded, but it's a sign that democracy isn't working, right? And I think the other thing that, you know, there's another great example that I write about in the book, which I don't know if you remember the um, Vogue cover of Stacey Abrams, where mm-hmm. the title was, Can Stacey Abrams stay, Save U.S. Democracy? Of course, that's a huge ask, but in a way, she and other voting rights activists in Georgia actually did, um, you know, but she wasn't elected. And that, I think, is is symptomatic of this pattern where we want the labor of Black voters, we want their votes, we want them to to do this heroic civic work, but we don't necessarily want them as leaders. We don't necessarily want their policy preferences to drive um, what happens in the country. And so, you know, we get the million profiles of the, you know, the Trump voters and the diners in the Midwest. And at the same time, we expect people to keep on doing this kind of heroic civic labor without having their needs or their preferences addressed without really any policy like just to return to the example that we we kind of uh touched on at the start there's been zero federal federal uh legislation on on police reform like none none uh and it's not a priority by the biden administration they like to fundraise off of it but I mean, they don't they haven't done anything on that front whatsoever. And yet the expectation is turnout better be high. Democracy is in peril. We need our base, black women in particular, to get to the polls. And there's not really um, a more like a, a an ideal democratic relationship between 
leadership in that way and the base and it's not of course police re police brutality reform or police reform that needs to be addressed but that's just one example that sticks out mm -hmm. to me as something that had you know is politically mobilizing but not something that's prioritized uh, by even a democratic administration Absolutely. And I think the other thing that you see is this sense um, in other areas, um, you know, if you think about something like um, addressing, you know, gerrymandering or addressing the ways in which Black voters are disenfranchised, like what can be done um, in those areas, right? Um, or, you know, um, is there a push, for example, to end felony disenfranchisement and how that affects because of mass, mass incarceration disproportionately affects people of color or things like, you know, um, um, things like student loans, which the administration did try to do and were blocked. But how, you know, but there is a sense, I think, often that um, that it people think that a gain for one group is a loss for them, right? So you have this kind of zero sum thinking. And I think in trying to appeal or, or win back, right, those mythical white working class voters, often the calculus is that they're more important and the policies um, that black voters might prefer that might actually help that constituency can kind of be set aside in favor of pursuing um, other blocks of voters. Yeah, and and the also the fact that in the political loss that you speak about, it's not loss is not felt in the same way by everybody. If you don't mind touching on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the the things that I think it's important for us to think about is to think about how loss continues to um, build on itself, right? So if you think about the, the sort of um, psychoanalytical ways in which people think about grief, the idea is, okay, um, you know, you suffer a loss, you come to terms with it, you get, right, you eventually move past it. But how do you do that when loss is ongoing? And this is the problem, right, I think for um, Black citizens in the United States is that if you think about the, you know, the heroic activism for centuries, really, to try to make the U.S. live up to its commitments in terms of, of, of racial equality. And it's still ongoing, right? And, and anytime there's progress, there's resistance. And that resistance means that anytime there's any kind of gain, you have these moral panics around the, you know, the sort of specter of racial equality or of advancement by black people, people of color. And, you know, so now you have these attempts to whitewash US history, these moral panics around things like DEI or critical race theory, where the very idea of actually teaching accurate history of actually, you know, including the perspectives of black citizens is a problem. Um, right. Yeah, right. I mean, absolutely. And, um, it's it, first it's DEI and then it's affirmative action. I mean, it's the same story every year. It's just they put a different they, they put a different branding on it. Um, I know I'm kind of uh, uh, this is uh, not something you discussed because it's so recent, but I am curious about your take on the in the news. There's been, you know, Arab voters are, are uh, especially in a swing state like Michigan right now. Um, many voters are saying that they will not vote for Biden again. They won't vote for Trump, but they'll probably either split a ticket or sit out, given Biden's support for um, the campaign of mass killing in Gaza. Um, that's just another example for me that struck me with your book of um, the kinds of expectations that voters who are not in the white majority are supposed to bear, because it's actually quite per it's perfectly rational in my opinion, when you're a, a very small minority in this country and you don't feel your voice is being heard and what choice do you have except to withhold your vote? But then when I have a conversation with a, with liberals, <laughs> it's all about, well, I mean, how, how could they? How could they? And uh, white liberals, really. <laughs> and uh, there's the, 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 that empathy gap there is so striking to me because I think to return to, to what you talk about, mm -hmm. grief and grievance are so different. And, and, and there's many people in this country have no idea what it's like to feel as though their government is actually deeply antagonistic to them. 
I think this is a really important point, right? So I think one of the things that happens is that, um, you know, people, I think, don't really think about whose losses are visible and whose losses are immediately attended to and whose are not. And so for people who um, who don't have their losses seen, there is this enormous added burden of you have to make your loss visible, you have to tell your story, you have to try to, to, to humanize it so that people will care. And I think it's it's really enormously you know, difficult for people to understand, like what happens when it feels like your government, the state that should be protecting your interests, literally does not see or does not want to see the losses that your community is suffering. And, um, and also that it's, it's, it's really unfair to ask people to have to prove their humanity in some way for us to care about their losses, which is, um, you know, something that I think um, we see in a lot of contexts right now, right? We see it with Palestinians um, we, in Gaza, we see it with women who are um, being affected by abortion bans who are having to come out and tell their stories. And I think it, it really is this, this issue um, that you're pointing to where, um, you know, it's like you say, it's perfectly rational for people to feel like, how can I support, um, you know, an administration that I feel that is not listening to my concerns at all. And, right. you know, but if, but if it's a, it's a group of white people, right. In a, in a diner again, <laughs> that's valid, but right. everyone else, but those, uh, but, but, but groups that don't get that, that kind of coverage or are not a part of the us as, uh, mm-hmm. you know, in, in mainstream, uh, the mainstream kind of like us like cultural thought or whatever that's that that kind of empathy is not extended and and you know i think your book does such a great job of 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 exploring that that topic um really appreciate your time today juliet hooker uh professor of political science uh royce family professor of teaching excellence in political science at brown university the book is called black grief uh white grievance the politics of loss. We will put a link to your book in the description wherever um, people are watching or listening to this. Thank you so much, Julie. I really appreciate it. Thank you.